Thanks very much for, for coming, and thanks for Mark, uh, to Mark for inviting me and for a characteristically understated introduction. Um, it, it's, a, it's a standard view among biblical scholars that Paul anticipated surviving right up until the end, right up until the second coming of Christ, or parousia, or as it's often called. And it's especially common in expressions of this view that Paul expected to survive to the end to cite two passages in particular, one from 1 Thessalonians and one from 1 Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians, or 1 Corinthians, I think, uh, in, in, the, uh, in translation. So from 1 Thessalonians 4, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. So many classic studies of Paul by scholars cite these two passages in particular as evidence that Paul believed that he would survive until the re return of Christ. And this has fed into whole reconstructions of early Christian history that uh, Paul started off with an expectation that Christ would return imminently. And then when that didn't happen, uh, other New Testament authors tried to sort of um, make sense of that fact and uh, re revise, how, uh, uh, revise expectations. And it's also had big theological consequences uh, in, in turn for uh, Christian belief for uh, some scholars. So uh, an ex as an example, uh, one of the most famous, well, probably the most famous New Testament scholar of the 20th century was a character called Rudolf Bultmann, who, say, who stated that the mythical eschatology, by which he means the idea that, the, the, that Christ would return bodily to earth and judge the living and the dead, the mythical eschatology is untenable for the simple reason that the parousia of Christ never took place as the New Testament expected. Or more recently, Trolls Engberg Pedersen, a Danish scholar, has stated, we cannot believe that Christ was imminently about to return and initiate the resurrection of human beings on the day of judgment, for it did not in fact happen in the way that Paul imagined it. Now, what I want to do in this lecture is to suggest an alternative view. What I want to suggest here is, and th this is uh, the, the sort of big main thesis, uh, which I think is printed on your, on your handouts as well, uh, is that depending on the situation and argument, Paul can adopt the stance of a survivor to the parousia, or he can put himself in the position of a participant in resurrection, resurrection from, from the dead, so dying before the parousia. So depending on the situation and argument, Paul can adopt the stance of a survivor to the parousia, or he can put himself in the position of a participant in resurrection. Now, this is not Paul changing his mind. Uh, rather, it's uh, a, a question of the perspective that he adopts when he's addressing his audience in the context of a particular point that he's making. Uh, and uh, so it's not that he's sort of changing his mind over time, but that he's changing his perspective. And he can change that perspective even within a single letter. Um, so it's not a sort of uh, development that he goes through over time. So the plan of my argument here is first to look at it in a bit more detail at those first two passages that I mentioned, those passages which, um, uh, in, in which Paul seems to be presenting himself as someone who will survive till the end and be, be alive when Christ returns. And after that, I want to look at other passages which seem to present a different perspective. Um, so uh, this, is, this is sort of focused on Paul's own view of where he will be at the end. So first, um, Paul as a witness to the parousia. I've mentioned already these two uh, passages in particular, which have been sort of proof texts for the idea that Paul will survive till the end. The first passage in 1 Thessalonians 3.18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep. According to the Lord's word, we tell you this. We who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, 
shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him, to meet the Lord in the air. So Paul is contrasting two groups here. The first group, the dead, uh, and those are sort of uh, in the sort of single underlining on the screen. Uh, they're described as those who sleep, uh, those who have fallen asleep, the dead in Christ. And the second group, those who are alive, um, those in the double underlining, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. Uh, then again in uh, verse 17, we who are alive and are left. Um, so in these two statements here, in the double underlining, Paul apparently includes himself among those who will remain until the parousia, until the second coming. Now the background to this passage is fairly clear. The Thessalonians were apparently anxious that those in the congregation who had died would either miss out on the parousia, miss out on the second coming altogether, or would be somehow disadvantaged when it came to salvation. And so what Paul is doing is consoling the congregation in Thessalonica by saying that the, the dead, those who've died, won't, in fact won't be disadvantaged at all and certainly will participate uh, in salvation just as much as those who are alive. And so Paul adopts in his argument here the contrast that the, Thessaloni the Thessalonians have been talking about, those who are dead and those who are alive. Paul, therefore, quite naturally, belongs among those who are alive, and he identifies himself with his Thessalonian audience in his consolation with them and distinguishes himself from the dead. He stands with them in their point of view rather than teaching that he will actually be a survivor. He's merely adopting uh, that perspective. So um, this view uh, that, uh, Thessalon what, that 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, assumes that Paul will survive till the parousia is taken by a great majority of scholars. There are some possible objections to it. There's a possibility of a slightly different translation here. The normal way to translate the passage uh, is in that first uh, alternative on the screen that we who are alive, uh, that is, those who are left. So the, the we who are alive means exactly the same as those who are left until the coming of the Lord. But there is another way to take it. You could equally well translate it as we who are alive and who also survive until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, it's introducing an extra condition. So we who are alive, comma, and who also survive until the end. And in fact, the King James Version seems to um, go, with that, uh, go with that view. Um, in other words, those of us who are alive and also survive till the parousia of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So, on that view, there's not a presupposition that Paul and his readers will necessarily survive to the end. But I'm not, I'm not sort of dogmatically asserting that that's the right view, but it is definitely an, a, a possibility. Moving on to 1 Corinthians 15. The second passage uh, looks ahead not to the coming of Christ as such, but to the transformation which believers will undergo when that happens. So in verses 51 and 52 here from 1 Corinthians 15. Here, let me tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will blast and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. So as in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is distinguishing between the living and the dead, between us who are alive and them who are dead. Paul, again, is following the terms of the argument. Uh, so on this view, on the standard view, he, um, in, in saying we will not all sleep, 
the implication is that some of us will die, but some of us will remain alive until the parousia. That's the, uh, the standard view, the contrast between the living and the dead. As in the case of 1 Corinthians, uh, as in the case of 1 Thessalonians, though, there's also another possible translation. Most of the translation go, go, with, go with the sort of one at the top, uh, and in fact, almost every translation and almost every scholar. But for the standard view to work, you have to assume that Paul got one of the words in the wrong place. And so a more strictly speaking accurate translation would be that none of us shall sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet. In other words, when the trumpet sounds, it's going to make a great noise. None of us will carry on sleeping at that point uh, because we'll all be woken up. So uh, this would be significant because it would mean that then Paul wasn't distinguishing between some of his audience who would survive and some of his audience who would, uh, who, who would die before the end. Again, I mention this just as a possibility at this stage. But if we accept, for the sake of argument, that the standard views of, this pas- of these passages are right, then Paul is presenting himself as someone who survives until the parousia. On the other hand, though, there is another set of passages in which Paul presents himself as someone who will not survive until the parousia. That some, that passages which present, in which Paul presents himself as someone who is going to take part in the great resurrection of the dead at the end. In other words, Paul is going to die before that event and when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead and, he's, and, 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 and all, are, all the, the living and the dead are, are raised, Paul himself will be raised because he uh, will have died. So, first example, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. By his power, God both raised the Lord and will raise us. So here, there's a direct analogy between what, happens to, what happened to Jesus, death and resurrection, and what will happen to Paul and his Corinthian audience, death and resurrection. In fact, Paul uses a, uh, unusually uses a, 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 an emphatic word for what resurrection he's going to experience. God will raise us up out. Uh, um, so it's a slightly unusual uh, term there. And it's obviously a future event. This is not Paul talking about a metaphor for the new life that we have in Christ. It's Paul talking about the, uh, the, the resurrection in the future. 2 Corinthians 4 is similar uh, in this respect. Uh, he writes, Since we have this same spirit of faith, as it is written, uh, um, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. So again, this is not a metaphor for uh, the new life of the Christian This is a reference to Paul saying that we will be raised from the dead just as the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. Finally, among the main examples uh, of this, Philippians 3, 10 to 11, where Paul expresses his desire to know him, that's Christ, both in the power of his resurrection and through participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to reach the resurrection from the dead. That's what Paul, in this passage, aspires to experience. And again, Paul uses a slightly unusual uh, term here. He doesn't just use the normal word for the resurrection, but the out-resurrection. You know, he, he really anticipates being raised up out of the ground uh, from the dead. Now, some other passages uh, have a similar perspective to this. So I've mentioned one already, uh, the alternative view of 1 Corinthians 15 that I've suggested. uh, In that view, uh, we have the the perspective that none of us uh, will will go on sleeping. None of us will sleep uh, when the trumpet sounds. Um, But uh, more of a a relevant example in Romans 8.11. Here, Paul's not talking so much about the expectation 
of what he'll go through, but of what his Roman audience will go through. Uh, that he presupposes in this statement that they will all die and then be raised. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Uh, so here again, he's talking about a future event and uh, just uh, with that sort of double emphasis on raising Jesus from the dead, raising Jesus from the dead. So uh, there's, a, there's a sort of, again, an emphasis on a, a future event there. Finally, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 to 10, which is a sort of different sort of example. Paul writes, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about our troubles in the province of Asia, for we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Now, some scholars have argued that Paul changed his view over the course of his career, that Paul started off with a sort of lively, imminent expectation that Christ could return any moment, but as he got older, he came to sort of think that, well, maybe this won't happen in my lifetime, maybe I will die before uh, the, the second coming of Christ. And quite a few scholars have argued that this event, this event that Paul went through in Asia, was, the turn, it was a sort of turning point, that Paul came really face to face with death in a new way and realized his own, own mortality and so changed his perspective at that historical moment. Now that seems to me actually very unlikely, even though some quite distinguished scholars have, uh, have argued this. The reason I think it's unlikely is that the way Paul goes on to talk is that this, the fact that God rescued him out of this absolutely terrible situation in which he looked certain to die, the way in which God rescued him from that gave him confidence that actually that would continue to happen. And so Paul goes on to write, uh, we, we, we'd received the sentence of death, this happened, this happened so that we might not rely on God, who raised, uh, not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises us from the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. So actually the Asia crisis, the crisis that he went through in the province of Asia, sort of almost confirmed his confidence. Uh, that he would go on living longer. But the key point for the argument here is that Paul can look back to a time when he really thought he might die. Um, so in common with the other passages in this little section here, uh, there were, the, you know, Paul can adopt the perspective of someone who's going to die. So that's where we've got to so far. We've had two pairs of passages, pair, pair, set, sets of passages which have contrasting perspectives. One in which he seems to present himself as someone who will uh, witness the parousia, the second coming of Jesus, and the other set which uh, make it look like he presents himself as someone who's going to participate in the resurrection from the dead. Now, as, I've met, as you can see, some of these passages come in the same letters. So 1 Corinthians, for example, has, uh, has both of those. Uh, so he can adopt different perspectives even in the same letter. And that's confirmed, I think, by a third set of passages in which uh, you can see Paul situating himself in either group or seeing both as possibilities. So just as Paul uh, puts himself in you know, one situation in one passage and another, one situation in another, he can oscillate between the, between one and the other in the very same passage even. Uh, like uh, John Kerry, as John Kerry was accused uh, by his detractors, uh, Paul is a, a sort of flip-flopper, although Paul does it on purpose. So, in the case of 1 Thessalonians, God has not appointed us for wrath, but to gain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, 
so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So, uh, in, we've, we've looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, a little bit al- al- already. When Paul gets into 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he's specifically addressing the times and the seasons, the time of Christ's return, and Paul goes on to say that actually the Lord will return like a thief in the night, and our responsibility is to stay on watch. Uh, and uh, that it will be uh, the, the, you know, the sudden judgment will be inescapable for those uh, who live in darkness. And so this comes at the conclusion of that argument, where Paul says that whether we are awake or whether we are asleep, we'll live together with him. So uh, here, Paul is no longer distinguishing between the living who will the living and the dead, the dead will rise and the, the, uh, the living will not precede them at the Parisia. Here he lumps everyone together, himself and the Thessalonians, whether, but, and, and says, but whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, we will uh, live together with him. So this is the first example of what one might call a sort of oscillation formula or an equivocation formula in which Paul uh, you know, has no fixed view. He can say that you know, he may live, he may die. You, you Thessalonians may live or you may die uh, before the Perusia. Similarly, in the letter to the Romans, I'll back up a little bit from the, uh, um, the passage on the screen. Uh, he begins the argument, one person judges one day above another, another judges every day to be alike. Each of them should be convinced in their own mind. The person who takes account of the day does so to the Lord. The person who eats does so to the Lord. The person, he gives thanks to God. The one who does not abstains from the Lord and gives thanks to God. And then here, the, the passage on the screen. For none of us lives for ourselves. None of us dies for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So we've got that alternation. We live, we die. We live, we die. So whether we live or die. So Paul can, in the context of his argument, put himself as sort of slipping between, uh, alternating between the two possible options. We get the same again in 2 Corinthians 5, which is one of the more complicated passages uh, on this question. Uh, earlier on in the in in the uh, in the chunk uh, in one in two Corinthians five, Paul has been talking about how he 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 may die, but he'd prefer to be clothed. He'd prefer to be uh, a participant in the Parousia and be clothed in in immortality without dying. Um, so, having mentioned these two possibilities earlier on in the chapter about, you know, he may rise from the dead, but he'd prefer to die, he sort of, again, oscillates between the two. Therefore, we are ambitious, whether we are at home or away, to be pleasing to him. Now, this is a bit of a difficult passage because it's not quite clear when Paul says at home rather than away. It's not quite clear whether he means at home here and away with the Lord or at home with the Lord and away here. Um, but so, so that's one of the sort of difficulties of the passage. But either way, he's expressing that alternation between whether we're at home, whether we're away. The point that Paul is making is that whatever situation you're in, his ambition is to be pleasing to God. So, uh, final passage on this, among this section, um, we've got uh, Philippians 1, 20. And in Philippians 1, Paul oscillates again. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now, as always, in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul in this chapter is going through, is in a bit of a dilemma as to whether he'd prefer to 
live or cannot carry on living or dying. He's in prison uh, facing possible death uh, and he's not sure which he would prefer. He says he longed to be with Christ, which is better by far, but he wants to go on living because he thinks that he will be a benefit to the Philippians that way. And indeed, he's come to a sort of conviction that he will carry on living. Um, at least that he'll carry on living until he sees them again. That's the sort of immediate horizon of his carrying on living. He doesn't, he doesn't express the view in Philippians that he's going to uh, survive to the parousia. So again, we have that sort of oscillation formula, whether by life or by death. So uh, in this final set of uh, um, passages, we've got an interesting consistency in Paul's sort of vacillation or oscillation about this living or death situation. And I think all of these are, are printed in a row on handout. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, we've got whether we're, whether we're on watch or we're asleep, whether we're awake or whether we're asleep. In Romans 15, whether we live or whether we die. In 2 Corinthians 5, whether we're at home or whether we're away. In Philippians 1, whether through life or through death. We've got slightly different vocabulary in each uh, uh, in each case. Sometimes living and living and uh, uh, being at home and on watch, versus sleeping and dying or being away. Um, but all of these four passages seem to have a strongly agnostic view for Paul about whether he will survive until the return of Christ. Almost, uh, I was going to say, almost indifference as to whether he will survive until the parousia, although he seems at times to express, uh, the, express a preference that he will survive. So overall in this first part, um, there's a marked alternation across all the passages in this first section. It appears that Paul is happy to entertain possibilities about whether he will survive until the return of Christ or not. Uh, he can adopt either perspective according to his argument. So in the first bit, assuming the standard translations of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, Paul can position himself and his audience as, as survivors until the return of Christ. At the same time elsewhere, he can adopt a stance of someone who is going to die and then be raised, uh, just as happened to Christ. And finally, in this third section, we've seen how Paul can flit from one perspective to another in the same verse and hold both possibilities at the same time in those weather or weather passages. Now secondly, and, and uh, you'll be re relieved to hear more briefly, I'm just going to give a very quick sketch of Paul's perspective in each of the letters and bring in some, some other uh, evidence at times. So if we look first at 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians has a very strong emphasis on the second coming of Christ. The parousia features in almost every argument that Paul makes in 1 Thessalonians, and that's partly because he's addressing a misunderstanding of the parousia uh, that the Thessalonians have fallen into. And one key point is that here Paul refers to the Thessalonians as waiting that uh, in chapter 1, they turned from idols to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven. And so we might think that this idea of waiting implies a, a very, very sort of quick return of Christ, an imminent return of Christ. But as we'll see, Paul has this waiting, this exhortation to wait all through his letters, not just uh, at the beginning. And as we've seen, Paul can adopt the perspective uh, of someone who uh, you know, looks like he might survive until the return of Christ in chapter 4, but also in the very next chapter, he then says, whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, um, we will be with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians, we have some passages which seem strongly to suggest a sense of an imminent return of Christ. Uh, the time is short or the time is foreshortened in chapter 7 also in chapter 7 the form of this world is passing away or in chapter 10 Christians of Paul's generation are those upon whom the end of the ages has come 
At the same time, as we've seen, Paul can adopt the perspective of someone who will be raised from the dead in 1 Corinthians again. And so uh, the resurrection, of course, as I'm, sure you, um, as I'm sure you know, is a huge theme as 1 Corinthians comes to the end. In 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection is the big topic of, uh, of, of, of 1 Corinthians 15. And it, it, it's a huge pastoral motivation for Paul. Paul sees the future resurrection of the dead as his motivation for continuing to endure hardship. So it's something that involves him. Again, he sees it as motivation for the Corinthians to stand firm, his, his audience, who are alive now, but who uh, he thinks may well participate in the resurrection from the dead. Paul faces danger all the time. He talks about fighting wild beasts in Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 15, and then in 1 Corinthians 16 goes on to talk about there, how there are many who still oppose him. And so uh, um, he, 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 he's envisaging you know, great danger ahead, um, which could well be life-threatening. And uh, I've mentioned already uh, several times my suggested alternative translation of that, uh, none shall go on sleeping. Next, Romans. Again, Romans has one passage in particular which might suggest an imminent parousia, an imminent return of Christ. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost over, the day is nearly here in Romans 13, verses 11 to 12. And in uh, chapter 16, Paul says that, the, that, that, God, that God will soon crush Satan under your feet. Again, the term soon being a key uh, potential indicator that Paul expects the return of Christ soon. But again, as we've seen, Paul can also picture his Roman, Roman hearers, I was going to say readers, uh, his Roman hearers as those who are going to die and be raised from the dead. If the spirit of, of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you, Romans 8, 11. Paul in Romans 5 and 6 generalizes about death uh, coming to all and uh, talks about how the Romans in chapter 8 should wait eagerly but also wait patiently. When we come to Romans 9 to 11, Paul certainly seems to envisage some sort of interval. He talks, of, he, he talks about the, uh, the, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. Uh, as el elsewhere in, the, in, in other letters, he talks about all the nations taking part in receiving the gospel. And so this fullness of Gentiles might well extend far beyond uh, just the sort of European Roman Empire that Paul had spent so much time in. As Richard Borkham has stated, for first century Jews, Jerusalem was not at the eastern edge of a world defined by the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean world depicted in maps of Paul's missionary journeys in Bibles and reference works. For first century Jews, Jerusalem was the center of a world which stretched as far east as it did west. So what might, Paul thought, what might Paul think that the Gentile world consisted of? What might the fullness of the Gentiles amount to? Well, here I need to warn you about my terrible map-making abilities. Um, but um, this is a very rough sketch of the, 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 the world in Old Testament terms. So uh, with the exception of a possible... Tarshish in, in Spain, uh, there's, all, you know, there's always a boat to Tarshish in, 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 in the book of Jonah. Um, it's quite plausible that, um, that, uh, that Tarshish is there. The Phoenicians, had, uh, um, who were you know, one of the peoples mentioned in the Old Testament, the Phoenicians uh, who, who um, occupied Tyre and Sidon, for example, had already had colonized North Africa and uh, the southern coast of Spain, um, so it wasn't certainly known to the Phoenicians. Um, but uh, 
uh, and, and in the south, uh, the Old Testament refers to Libya and Ethiopia. Uh, and up in the north, uh, Ashkenaz, uh, in sort of Russian, Russian territory. Um, and uh, Darius's empire, according to the Book of, Emp uh, uh, the Book of Esther, extends from Egypt to India. So we already have, even just in the Old Testament, quite an extensive Gentile world uh, known about, no, uh, known by someone who was well acquainted with the, uh, with the Old Testament. If we move to the first century, we can take Jose Josephus as a convenient example of someone who talks quite extensively about the known world, especially in his discussion of the, in two passages in particular, where he's talking about the extent of the Roman Empire, but also where, in his interpretation of Genesis, he talks about the table of the nations, you know, the, the, the descendants of, uh, of those early um, figures in the Old Testament and the lands that they occupied. So uh, Josephus talks extensively about the west of Africa and even what he calls the Atlantic Sea to the west of Africa and the ocean which extends from the west uh, coast of France or Gaul uh, up um, beyond the west coast of Britain. Uh, Ashkenaz is represented by the Scythians who again occupied sort of Russian territory and uh, Josephus goes beyond, the Old Testament talks about India but Josephus knows about further territory beyond the east of India uh, in what he calls Seria. Uh, um, Seria is related to the Greek word for silk. So Seria is the silk country, in other words, probably Western China. So Josephus' knowledge of the, uh, of the world is pretty extensive. Uh, he has various interpretations uh, of, of, of Old Testament places and puts them in their modern well, modern for him, in their modern language. So the river Pishon in, in, in Genesis, he understands as the river Ganges. And interestingly, when Josephus sort of translates the places in Genesis into their sort of modern, in, in, into you know, the, the, the more familiar geographical locations of the first century, he assumes that his readers know what he's referring to. Um, one scholar has said that Josephus seems to assume that once he's told the reader the modern equivalent, the reader will be able to use his own knowledge to put the term in question on the map. So Josephus, in talking about this geographical terminology, doesn't think he's using you know, any particularly specialised knowledge. It may well be the kind of knowledge that was shared by Paul, particularly, I think, as Paul probably rubbed shoulders with a lot of traders and uh, so you know, the, the traders were the people who really knew about, uh, had, had knowledge of the, um, of the outside world. Um, as in 1 Corinthians, Paul faces great danger in uh, uh, Romans as well, just moving on from the geographical side of things. Uh, he talks about how Christians are like sheep to be slaughtered. He faces the prospect of the sword or death in Romans 8. Um, and you know, he may face the prospect of the sword, he may not. He may face death, he may not. But what, of course, in that wonderful passage in the conclusion of Romans 8 says that what is the constant that we can be sure of is the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's where Paul's certainty lies, certainly not in an imminent expectation of the end. In 2 Corinthians, uh, we've seen already how God's rescue of Paul's life uh, gives him a sense of confidence, even though he's faced a situation that seemed like it was going to be deadly. And also Paul talks in terms of his audience and himself being raised from the dead. God who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will will, with Jesus will raise us with Jesus. At the same time, as I've mentioned, he sees in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, resurrection as only a possibility and something that he would he'd, he'd prefer to live. But again, just as he's not sure whether he's going to be raised uh, at the end or whether he's going to survive to the end, what he's focused on is pleasing the Lord. 
Therefore, we are ambitious, whether we are at home or away, to be pleasing to him. It's the desire to please God in 2 Corinthians 5 that is the constant amidst the uncertainty of whether or not Paul will live to survive till the end. Finally, Philippians. As I've already already mentioned, the monologue that Paul goes through in Philippians 1, is it better to live or is it better to die? Um, And uh, he eventually thinks it's better, better for him to survive until the end for the Corinthians' benefit. At the same time, he also envisages himself being raised from the dead in Philippians. Uh, as he puts it, attaining, if I might somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead, which includes the transformation from humility to glory that he talks about later in chapter 3. And just as we saw in in probably Paul's earliest letter, 1 Thessalonians, we also see in what is probably Paul's latest letter, Philippians, still an emphasis on waiting. Paul hasn't changed uh, his view. He continues to talk about waiting uh, until the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, comes from heaven uh, in Philippians 3 again. Sorry, I'll skip through these uh, slides. To conclude, as I mentioned at the beginning, my purpose is you know, not to solve all the problems of, the New, of what the New Testament says about the timing of the end uh, and going into all those uh, pre-millenniums and post-millenniums and amillenniums and uh, millennia, it should be, shouldn't it? Um, but, uh, but to focus on this, just this question of whether Paul expected to survive until, until the end. And I hope to have offered a, a new perspective on some of these important texts. They've often, uh, one, the 1 Corinthians 15 passage and the 1 Thessalonians 4 passage in particular have been sort of proof texts for scholars that Paul must have expected the end to come, with, you know, some scholars say within months uh, or certainly within a few years. But what I've tried to do here is to situate those passages, passages in which Paul adopts the perspective of surviving till the Perusia alongside those other passages in which he adopts the perspective of someone who's going to die and then be raised, as well as those passages where he sort of says, well, whether we live or whether we die, whether we're on watch or whether we're asleep, uh, whether in life or whether in death. The result of this, I think, is that it's apparent that it's the particular argument that Paul's engaged in or the particular uh, consolation that Paul is intending to give his audience that shapes the way in which he talks about the parousia rather than because he has a fixed opinion about it or that he has a fixed opinion in one letter which then he changes uh, as, he, as, he, as he gets older, for example. In other words, Paul has no fixed view at all of whether he would live to witness the parousia. As he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. According to 2 Corinthians at five, Paul may die or he may not. The constant is his ambition to please the Lord. Similarly, in Romans 8, Paul may face death and the sword or he may not. The unconditional constant in Romans 8 is the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Thanks very much for your attention. Here we go. What impact does Philippians 128b for me to live as Christ and to die is gain have on Paul's view as making it to the end? I think I think it's part it's part of that sort of oscillation, isn't it? That he 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 he, he's, he's feeling torn in Philippians 1. Well, you know, in, in, in a lot of Philippians 1, he feels that, 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 that tear that he, you know, he's, he's in prison. He wants, he, he wants all this suffering to, he wants the, you know, Roman prisons were bad, right? So, you, you know, you were basically left to, 
to rot and to you rely on people coming to feed you uh, and uh, uh, there was no prospect of, you know, people frequently died in prison uh, there was no prospect necessarily of uh, of, of making it to, 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 to trial um, and uh, um, so he sees he, he sees that you know death he longs to be with Christ which is better by far so he, he longs for death uh, at this point but at the, at the same time he longs to uh, to, to, to to carry on living um, and and so uh, we see not I suppose it's not just an expression of whether Paul thought he would uh, um, survive till the till the Perusia, but that it, it was sort of about, I suppose, his not necessarily desire to survive to the Perusia, but his desire to go survive at least until he can be a further benefit to the Philippians. In a case like this that is not clear cut, how can today's interpreter minimize or avoid the risk of confirmation bias? Confirmation bias being one of the oldest mental shortcuts. It's where we tend to read and understand and interpret evidence in light of a hypothesis or opinion we already hold. Um, well, I, spe- I, I, I suppose the, w- the way you, the way scholars usually have their confirmation bias challenged is by presenting views to other scholars who disagree with them and I, you know, I gave a similar paper to this in, uh, in, in, in Durham University in January um, where other people in the seminar were there are other people there who, who take the view that Paul one of them has published an article saying that he that, that Paul thinks in 1 Thessalonians that Christ is going to return in a matter of months. Um, and, and so that's what, that's what scholarly debate is about, that you have your, you have your confirmation, your, your, your biases challenged. Um, and I actually think that this is, you know, the, the, the standard scholarly view is that it is clear-cut that Paul did believe in an imminent return of Christ. Uh, and I think that actually it's pretty clear cut that he didn't Um, and I think you know when you put all those passages like whether we live or whether we die whether we live or whether we die you know four times in Paul's uh, in different letters um, when you put those passages uh, together uh, I think quite quite a different picture emerges okay um, this is an interesting question that I'm almost not asking um not that I would ever edit, um, but I think I'm going to ask it just for grins. <laughs> um, and, and you may find the way the question is worded to be something that inherently you have a different view on that you may want to talk about. I've never asked you about your view on this. Mm-hmm. So here you go. Do you make a distinction between the rapture of the church and Christ's second coming? Do I make a distinction between the rapture of the church and the second coming? Uh, no, I think in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, which is the only place where Paul talks about any sort of rapture, um, he... he, he Go right back to the beginning here. Um, yeah, according to the Lord, Lord's word, we who tell you this, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so Paul is describing here what is, happen- what, what is going to happen at the return of Christ. And that's when the dead are the dead are raised and the 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 living are raptured. However, one understands that. Yeah. So I think maybe the question is digging a little bit more into the area of of 
what would be termed a premillennial versus perhaps an amillennial view in the sense of is that uh, uh, different than the ultimate return of Christ in the end of time as opposed to this return of Christ I, I, I don't uh, yeah Look, this is tough for me. I'm just, I'll just make it plain and you can lose all respect for me. I'm a millennial, so I can't handle these terms very well. Um, and so, I mean. Next uh, question. Yeah. All right, let's just keep going. Um, oh, this is a good question. Not that that was a bad question, but this is a good question. Could you say more about how Paul's understanding of Christ's love for him affects his view of the parousia? Mm. That is a good question. Um, I suppose I, I suppose Paul must have must have believed that that Christ would return at the time when at the time that would be that would most express God's love for the world. Um, and that that is obviously as two Peter emphasizes that God is giving people time to repent and that's a a gracious act um, by God I suppose in the paper what I was more focusing on was that the love of Christ is a is a sort of constant uh, amidst the the uncertainty uh, you know uh, the love of Christ is a certainty amidst the uncertainty about when Christ might return Well, that ties well with this next question. Uh, Paul had a thorough understanding of the Old Testament. Would that have influenced his not being so certain about the timing of Christ's return? He would probably understand God's timing and timetable could be long term. Mm -hmm. And then it would fit hand in hand with God's chesed, his his, uh, Mm. covenant loyalty and love and, and all that's just inherent throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. And yet God, you know, Israel's in bondage for 400 years. You've got 400 years since there's been prophetic voice. You've mm-hmm. got, you know. Yeah, so, so the, old covenant, the old covenant lasts quite a long time. Um, and so maybe someone, someone suggested this to me the other day. I think it was, was it you, Murray? <laughs> um, Murray Smith suggested that, you know, therefore the new covenant we might expect to last uh, a similar length of time. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got God's loving kindness displayed in his mercy in, um, in the Old Testament uh, and displayed in his mercy in, 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 in waiting to, to allow people time to repent. We've also got, of course, the promise in the Old Testament of the hope that the Gentiles would come in, and that's something which very much uh, animates Paul's Paul's mission. Uh, and uh, um, the the Old Te- Old Testament Gentiles, as as I tried to display in my terrible maps, uh, were, constituted quite a lot of people. Uh, and so Paul may have may may well have thought that there are people who haven't, you know, people still a long way away who haven't heard the good news yet. Yeah. Do you think Paul was hedging his bets, taking both views? <laughs> um, in, in a sense, in, in a sense that he didn't know, right? So, so he, he, he urges people to, to be on watch, because it could happen any time. Um, so you can't just sort of think, well, there are people from, you know, the land of silk in China who haven't come yet, so I've got to, I've got to you know, I can, I can repent on my deathbed. <laughs> um, um, uh, he, he perhaps didn't know, uh, well, I think he probably didn't know what, um, what would count as the fullness of the Gentiles. Is it, would it be people from every sort of, to, to use an anachronistic, every continent, sort of every air, you know, north, south, east, and west, from every, um, uh, every one of the descendants of Noah, say, the, 
the, yeah, the, yeah. the Hamites, the Shemites, and the Japhethites, um, or, 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 or is it something you know that depends on people from Papua New Guinea? Or, so, do um, you find it interesting that you know Paul at least has some early references to Jesus and his sayings and his teachings because? Mm-hmm. Paul's letter to the Corinthians has the same exact spelling terminology as Luke on the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Um, um, When you add to that understanding that Paul certainly had access to at least some parchments of sayings and things like Mm -hmm. that, um, does it make a difference that Jesus said he didn't even know? Mm -hmm. Uh, only his father in heaven. He didn't even know when the second, uh, coming of the Son of Man would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if Paul had, had had such understanding from Jesus, does it mm. not make sense that mm. it would have extended to him? Yeah, I think, it, I, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians in particular where you see Paul echoing a lot of what Jesus says about the second coming. So uh, in, in, one th- in, in, in chapter 5 in particular, um, the, the son of, you know, Christ will come like a thief in the night in, 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 one Corinthians, in 1 Thessalonians 5, which obviously echoes what Jesus taught in Mark 13 and parallels. Um, we've got sudden destruction, again, which, I th- which, is some, which is something Jesus refers to in the, uh, in the Olivet discourse uh, in, in the Gospels. Um, and so, uh, uh, and again, that sort of uncertainty about the timing. I, I, th- I think Paul certainly relies on Jesus' tradition about um, the end. How does your doctrine of revelation inform your approach to the passages of Scripture in question? And I, I think I know yeah. where this is coming from if you want more detail, but if you've got it, run with it. Yeah, so... so um, I suppose I have quite a traditional doctrine of revelation, and so it would be a problem for me if if Jesus and Paul got things wrong. <laughs> um, so, so I, I sort of start with the assumption that Jesus was probably right about you know what he said about the end, and that Paul <laughs> that Paul was as well. And so that's uh, you know in terms of com- you know, the question about confirmation bias, I suppose that is my bias. Um, um, but I don't think that necessarily leads to wrong conclusions. <laughs> In other words, uh, would it be fair to say one of, one of my dogmatic concerns is someone who, like Bart Ehrman, who is always welcome to watch this if you're watching on the Internet, come see us. Um, someone who, like Bart Ehrman who presents what I consider to be a false dichotomy of either it's uh, God who wrote scripture or it's humanity that wrote scripture mm-hmm. and he doesn't seem to understand that God works through people to mm-hmm. produce scripture mm-hmm. that, that so scripture can have Paul's uncertainty in it mm-hmm. and still be authoritative just like a psalm can have anger and, and vitriol in it and mm-hmm. still be yeah. inspired yeah. 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 and Jesus himself is uncertain about when the end will come yeah 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 Yeah. okay uh thank you simon uh thoughts on the dialect dialect between belief and experience in paul's oscillation and paul signed his note so if you want more in the question i'll (laughs) hand him the microphone um I mean, quite a few of the passages that I mentioned do refer to Paul's experience, don't they? So the, 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 the crisis in Asia um, that he refers to where he, he, he um, came face to face with death, but God delivered him, that gives him confidence that he's going to live a bit longer because he says that God will continue to deliver me on the basis of what he's, what he's done already. Um, and he's informed by the potential that he has to help the Philippians in Philippians 1, that that gives him sort of an incentive, you know, even though he would prefer to be with Christ in many ways, that gives him an incentive to, um, uh, to, to go on living, to go, to go and see them again. Um, so I, 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 it's, not just, it's not just Paul's brain operating. <laughs> 
uh, when he when he's writing. He's talk, he, 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 he's talking about his the interactions that he's had with uh, the Corinthians and the Philippians and uh, and others. Um, so yeah, it's not just sort of propositional truth that he's expressing, although that's a part All right, of it. I've got time for, we've got time for two more, and then uh, uh, we'll set you free. Is part of the problem that scholars are reading the passages in question as if they're technical manuals instead of less formal letters, i.e. instead of um, in, uh, something passive reflexive usage Paul addressed the parties directly and inclusively I think we can I think you know I suppose I'm biased because I did my PhD on Paul I think we can get quite a lot from the sort of details of, of, of Paul and about his assumptions um, I, I think those scholars can read Paul sort of I think that I think this is the case with that one Thessalonians four and one Corinthians fifteen passage that these are treated as treated rather woodenly as woodenly yeah woodenly yeah okay go yeah. ahead keep so, going um, I was translating with, without without um, without paying sufficient attention to what what Paul says elsewhere um, last question where do you see yourself in the Perusia? Well, someone, someone asked me l last night if I, if I thought that the Perusia was going to come before this lecture, and I said, I hope so. Because <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then I'd be let off. <laughs> um, I, I want uh, you to know Pastor Jarrett Stevens, who used a sermon illustration a couple of months ago. That's a story worth telling as we bring this to a close, and this will give... No, you have to listen to this story. Get up here. <laughs> oh, yes, talking about the Perusia, the second coming. Uh, when I was uh, first uh, uh, preaching, my first opportunity to preach at my church in Dallas, which was a large church I'd never preached before uh, in, in front of a, that size of a congregation. I was 29 years old. And uh, was just so nervous. Uh, I mean, this was my first shot. You can't mess this up. And I told the church, and, and I mean this, it, I'm not making this up. I prayed every single day that week that Jesus would return before I preached that message. Uh, but he didn't, and uh, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> would you join me in thanking Dr. Simon Gather Cole? <laughs>